So I'm sure you've all seen a picture of this somewhere on the internet. Modern CPU, a die shot specifically of Zen 2. And if we look at this, there's a lot of things that are in presence in our modern CPUs just to make our generic code faster, like branch prediction, load stores, multi HD decoders, and so on. But I would also argue that if we want to do some domain-specific things, let's say linear algebra, there's actually very little need for many of these things, right? If we already know how many times our loops will execute, why do we need branch prediction? If we already know the precise access patterns, why do we need a prefetcher? That was sort of the idea that ETH Zurich had when they wrote their RISC-V snitch core. Rather, instead, the, what they tried to do is try to uh, get high-level information into the RISC-V ISA and provide very neat and smart extensions to replace all of these components to then gain a lot of power efficiency and a uh, very small die area. Specifically, uh, one of the main uh, extensions they use is streaming registers, where you can pre-configure uh, the floating point registers uh, already present in the RISC-V ISA to instead iterate and alias a memory region. Uh, then hardware loops are used to uh, denote a body that should simply be repeated a given number of times instead of needing co uh, complicated control flow instructions. And if we have a software managed cache rather than a hardware managed cache, then we can simply move the tiles ahead of time since we uh, know th uh, that this tile will be accessed for the next few operations. Um, what they could then do by uh, simply through these performance per watt improvements and through a uh, very small die area, is scale this to massive parallelism. So they made a chip called Okami that actually has 384 of these niche cores, and despite running at 1 gigahertz, only has 10 watts of, uh, of uh, energy usage. We thought that this somewhat looked like a GPU, meaning that also you could reuse a lot of the infrastructure that people created for compiling linear algebra to GPUs. Uh, the way we then went uh, about making our compiler for this Okami chip is effectively splitting it into two parts. First, a neural network compiler, where details such as the 128 kilobyte shared memory that uh, each snitch cluster has, plus the eight compute cores and DMA core uh, per snitch cluster, are very important for uh, multiple considerations and optimizations. But then also a microkernel compiler, where we reduce the problem to just saying, okay, we're working on a single core, our data is already in the, lo in the closest memory possible, but here are other hardware details, such as uh, the fact that we, uh, have, um, that we have three streams and that each of these uh, uh, streams can only support a four-dimensional uh, affine access pattern are more important. For optimizations, we also really need to care about having a four-stage FPU, for example. Going deep into the microkernel compilers now, Sasha. So uh, the objective is to uh, compile automatically linear algebra microkernels on a single core and uh, to always be number crunching. So the question is, how do we implement such a compiler? Well, LLVM is great because it reduces a great number of, uh, well, it, you can reduce a great number of different sources to a single universal representation and then uh, lower it to a great number of different targets. However, by having this universal representation, you necessarily lose a lot of uh, important domain specific information. MLIR um, has this multi level. A learning approach that helps you do optimizations at the most appropriate level. So some of them are better done on Linux before learning further. Uh, however, when you still go through this LVM IR, some target specific optimizations are harder to do. You need to reinfer this domain specific information. We went about this by implementing a number of target specific risk five uh, dialects that also use this multi-level approach. So at the lowest level, the operations looked like assembly instructions. For this load immediate um, operation, we have attributes that represent the constant. We have the type that represents which register the constant is stored to. Similarly, we have uh, labels that denote the start of basic blocks. And we represent jumps as block terminators. This also makes it quite easy to do instruction selection because an arith.constant is very similar to a load immediate. Similarly, for the arithmetic instructions, memref is a bit more complicated. I'm looking for forward to the pointer dialect to make it simpler. So what this lets us do is extend our compiler just by adding a few more uh, dialects and some more transformations, some of which at the target-specific level also potentially 
at multiple levels of abstraction, <coughs> representing either the assembly operations or the uh, high-level concepts, and at a target-independent level. For example, a hardware loop it can be a structured loop with a single operand of the number of uh, iterations, and the streaming region can uh, both contain the body uh, for the streaming region and the setup instructions. What's interesting about this is that we're able to do a, almost all the optimizations at a target-independent level, um, going directly from Linux generics uh, operations uh, in our pipeline. And the result is pretty good. So we get almost 100% FPU utilization in our uh, MathMall benchmark, and we get more than 90% uh, for almost all the other benchmarks that we've looked at. Right, now we basically have perfect performance for a single core. So now the question is how do we scale this to actually whole neural networks and to work on our 384 cores? So we based our work on Erie, our already pre-existing open source MLIR compilers for these machine learning models, so that we can reuse a lot of the infrastructure, like the importers and uh, all the mid-end. And we effectively extended it with a, device, uh, with a uh, custom backend, which we just called Quidditch, where we add our own passes and dialects to represent some of the peculiarities of our hardware. Uh, so the most important optimization I think many of you are uh, almost certainly familiar with is tiling. So we need tiling in this case for two reasons. Uh, first of all, we need it for uh, we want it for distribution. So in this case, for example, uh, on the workgroup level, we want to distribute the work of a single matrix vector multiply among multiple snitch clusters. When we are inside a single snitch cluster, we then need to care a lot more about the memory use. For our streaming registers to work, the, our working set has to be in the L1 memory uh, next to the snitch cluster. And for that, we do a temporal tiling of the uh, workgroup until we're down to 128 kilobytes. This last level of tiling is rather simple, where we then just distribute the work of this single tile among our eight compute cores. Um, representing this move into the L1, we do uh, via operations that actually operate on tensors. So we have to start tensor copy and wait for tensor copy operations. Um, this is, uh, already models the asynchronous nature of our DMA core and effectively acts as an assertion that this tensor after bufferization has to be in L1. If it happens to already be in L1, this actually turns into a no op during bufferization. And since we're still in tensor land and have nice SSA used dev chains, we can just reuse a lot of the upstream stream MLIR optimizations. So in this case, for example, the uh, copy of this VEC reslice is completely loop invariant to the STL4 it's contained in, meaning that if we just run the upstream loop invariant curve motion pass, we can move it out of the loop and are effectively uh, reducing our memory bandwidth requirements drastically. The next problem we face in the, all of this is that by default now, we effectively kind of have two phases where we first do this DMA transfer from global memory into the L1, and then are doing our computation, the streaming regions in blue that you can see here. This kind of caps us at a 50% FPU uh, occupation. Ideally, what we want is to be able to interleave this, so we can always do, uh, always do number crunching, but while number crunching is happening, are already moving our, uh, the memory, the, tile for the next uh, iteration. The way we implement this is using a custom uh, op in MLIR, a pipeline operation, which at first glance looks a lot, a lot like an STF4 loop, but actually defines multiple regions, which are the stages of our software pipeline. After bufferization and then lowering, we can just copy paste these regions in a specific pattern um, that allows us to um, to start the tensor copy that you can see in the first region in orange, um, at the same time as we are waiting and then already performing the computation for the uh, other copy in the purple region. Now for evaluation, we uh, tested all of this on a hardware simulation with Variolator of a single snitch cluster, meaning eight compute cores, and we compared it to Eri's already pre-existing LLVM backend. So this is not really a super fair comparison, given that uh, Eri's LLVM backend is not aware of our RISC-V ex um, extensions as well, uh, and it cannot do tiling based on the uh, L1 memory that we have, but nevertheless, somewhat useful. So for uh, on the left, you see an execution of NSNet2. This is a neural network, a recurrent neural network for audio denoising, and we're going basically processing a single frame for this. And here we're seeing a 22.4x speed of it, for example. Um, on the right side, uh, we zoomed in on the biggest kernel of NSNet2 that is taking the majority of our runtime. Um, here, the 
Our Quidditch uh, solution is basically taking 90k cycles for this MedTech, while LLVM is like a 2 million. Very nice to see a section that the theoretical maximum, as in how many floating point operations you would require to do this MedTech, um, is at 60k, so we're not perfect yet. There's still some low hanging fruits we need to address, but we're relatively close and especially much closer than LLVM. Thank you. Thank you both.